So it's my privilege as the secretary of the Ogden Surgical Society to introduce the senior residents speaking to us this year. We're trying a little bit different format this year. Uh, instead of having all of them present at once, lining up all here for the questions afterwards, we're gonna do it in two bunches plus one. Uh, so uh, taking advantage of technology, our final seventh speaker will be um, via technology. Uh, it's not artificial intelligence, it's real normal intelligence, but it'll still be remote. So our first three are uh, Taylor Stoddard, Justin Coles, and Bryce Barton. Um, and they will be each speaking approximately uh, 15 minutes, after which there will be a question and answer session for them as a group. So it won't be done individually. We'll wait until all three of them have spoken. Uh, they'll introduce themselves. Uh, and then afterwards, again, we'll have questions. Then we'll introduce the second set. So. Uh, Taylor Stoddard, you're on. Okay, hello. My name is Taylor Stoddard. I'm one of the third year family medicine residents. Thanks for having me. Uh, to start, I'll introduce myself. I'm originally from Ohio. I went to University of Toledo for medical school and finally got out to the mountains uh, for residency. Uh, my future practice will be at Layton Clinic. Very excited. Um, also doing half time at the residency as one of the faculty members. I have no financial disclosures. Uh, here you can see a picture of myself backpacking uh, in a central Ohio back in the day. Uh, I also used to rock climb a little bit more, so that's bouldering up on the east bench of Ogden, one of our favorite places to watch the sunset. So to start off, uh, I want to have everyone imagine this scenario. You've got a first time mom. She's the outdoorsy type, so she says, I'm gonna get one last run in on the ski hills. She's, she's uh, 37 weeks pregnant. It's a term, but scary pregnant, right? Um, and she falls. Whose heart rate is already going up with that? Yeah. <laughs> like, we're thinking abruption, we're thinking bleeding, like baby's life is at, at stake here. And in the meantime, her friend is going way too fast in yard sales. You've got a ski over here and a, a hat over there. And he says, oh, my leg hurts, my leg. And so you're immediately thinking pelvic fracture, you're, you've got femur fracture, it could be, he could be bleeding out right there. I mean, what are you going to do? You're the only doctor, of course, and they're all looking at you. So, scary, right? It's not working. Uh, so I was introduced to wilderness medicine back in medical school. I started as a wilderness first responder, just getting a course because I was interested. Um, and I was then introduced with a medical wilderness adventure race, so med war wilderness adventure race. Uh, at that time, it was in, in uh, central Michigan, and I was a judge. And so the scenario was you had to come in and do a chest tube. And so they had a mannequin with a, a rack of ribs in it. And you had to put the chest tube with whatever you had available on you. And so I was the one checking off the boxes for the, the residents and, and doctors that were participating in this, in this wilderness adventure race. Um, and so that was my first taste of wilderness medicine, and I loved it. So then I did a wilderness medical society elective for a month in my fourth year. And the last week of the month was backpacking on the Appalachian Trail. So a couple of pictures from me on the Appalachian Trail. So currently, wilderness medicine education is mostly done within emergency <laughs> medicine residencies. That's just where they found their niche. Um, so two thirds of ER residencies uh, will have some sort of wilderness medicine education, but it's variable as far as how much they get. So. 
Half of them reported less than five hours. A third of them said, well, we just do an advanced wilderness life support course and call it good. Um, there are 22 fellowships. So after residency, you can go on to do a year-long fellowship in specifically wilderness medicine. But these are mostly for emergency medicine residents. There are only a couple that are for family medicine residents, and sometimes they don't even fund those. But I would argue that wilderness medicine is applicable to all providers, especially family medicine providers, because of the skills that you learn. It's rural and austere medicine. It's medicine that's done when you have less resources. It's improv skills. It's sports medicine, musculoskeletal. It's, it's pregnancy on the ski slopes, you know? Um, you've got altitude sickness, bloodborne illnesses, emergency disaster training. The list goes on and on. I mean, I'm not going to go through this, but the point is that wilderness medicine is important to learn, in my opinion. So currently at McKD Family Medicine Residency, uh, we are not currently advertising any wilderness medicine training. However, we are doing some of the training. Uh, so some of that includes being a part of the ski clinic staff up at Snow Basin. We do several events like the Ogden Marathon tomorrow, we'll be there. Uh, practical skills and hands-on scenarios such as hypothermia skills um, and splinting, things like that. We also enjoy listening to Dr. Inga Bretson, who's one of our esteemed University of Utah faculty who uh, does a wilderness medicine trip to Chamonix, France, France that I'll be joining with this summer. And so as part of my research, my question was, where do we stand with this? Do family medicine applicants desire more wilderness medicine training? So I kept it pretty simple. I just wanted to get a baseline of where, where do we stand? What, what, is, what is the status quo? So I sent out a one minute survey to our 62 applicants for the current match year and about half responded. So the first question here is, when researching residency program websites, I specifically looked for mention of wilderness medicine training. And so I know that when I was in that position, I was specifically looking, does this program offer wilderness medicine? Surprisingly, most people disagreed. As you can see, the largest is disagree. And really, the majority disagreed with that statement. The next question was, when deciding where to apply for residency, I looked for a program with an established wilderness medicine program. And here, more people tended to go neutral to disagree uh, for the most part. There were only six people who were really looking for an established wilderness medicine program. Then the next question, when evaluating a program like wilderness medicine, Having accredited faculty, like fellows of the Wilderness Medical Society, is important to me. And here, most people were neutral. 12 of the 32 responses were neutral. And it pretty much exactly followed a bell curve. So there was no strong agree or disagree to this question. And then in comparison to other family medicine programs, my opinion of the McKay-D Family Medicine Residency is that it has a strong wilderness medicine program. So here's the first question that you can see that a lot of the uh, applicants answered more towards neutral agree, strongly agree, which was nice to see. However, when I looked more closely at the data, the average of this this graph here is 3.3 out of the five point scale, meaning they're just above average. Whereas if you look at specifically the people who were looking for wilderness medicine, they tended to mark that McKD was uh, a little bit less strong. So they were completely neutral on McKD's program specifically. 
So hard to say what that means exactly, but I thought it was a unique point. And then the final question on my survey uh, was just mark three of the activities that are important to you in a wilderness medicine curriculum. And you can see here that most people wanted outdoor injury practical exercises. They then said the next uh, most important to them were certifications like advanced wilderness life support and wilderness first responder. Um, surprising to me was that they didn't care as much about ski days and hikes and we even put in there anything that lets me play outside of the hospital for residency, come on. So that was surprising, but good, good information as a baseline. Um, and then they had an opportunity to just put down comments about what did you ask during an interview? And I wanted to specifically bring this one out. This was from a single applicant. He said, what does your programming consist of? E.g., one program said they had great wilderness med, but turns out it used to be more active, and now it's just a day rafting trip. That's group bonding outdoors, not wilderness med education. I asked if they teach AWLS. I asked if there are wilderness retreats and if families can attend those. Wilderness med curriculums were very important to me, even more for the indication of the types of residents and faculty than for the education itself. Wilderness Med will be a lot of fun to learn, but I don't need that certification or education. I do need to work with residents and faculty who value outdoor adventures and who hopefully will come rafting, climbing, skiing, biking, backpacking with me and my family. The quality of the Wilderness Med training is closely correlated, as far as I can tell from interviews, with the outdoorsiness of the people. And I really, uh, I, uh, that was kind of how I felt going into my residency interviews, and so I thought that was very important. Um, other themes when people were just writing out their comments about what they asked about in interviews, they asked about what's the time commitment, is it more of a, an integrated type of course, or is it more of a block course, they asked, can you get progress towards certification? And how many current residents are interested? All good questions. So my conclusions from this survey about wilderness medicine and residency was somewhat limited by the applicant pool. Obviously, we're only asking these 62 residents that were interested specifically in McKay D Family Medicine Residency in a single year. And only one in five were interested in wilderness medicine training, which was honestly surprising to me. Um, they also desired outdoor injury, practical exercises over any kind of ski days, hikes, certifications even. And overall, we have room to improve at McKD in our wilderness medicine education. So in the future, as future faculty, I have plans to uh, increase our wilderness medicine curriculum, develop a, an annual core curriculum that we're doing something every month. I, I'll de be developing skills sessions and we, I, I believe we should be marketing more that we are a wilderness medicine education residency. And finally, I'm in the midst of planning a, a medical wilderness adventure race of my own for the residents that will be on June 24th at Snow Basin, if anyone is interested in coming to be a part of the fun, I'd love to have you. Um, and so that's my talk on wilderness medicine in residency. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, some of you sharp-eyed observers may be looking at your program brochures and thinking, that's, that's Dane Lyman up there. That's not the case, unfortunately for me, really. Uh, you will hear from him a little later on. Uh, my name is Justin Coles. I'm one of the third year residents at McKady Family Medicine Residency as well. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about uh, medical care for the collegiate club athlete. Um, let's see if we can get this going. So I have no financial or conflicts of interest I need to disclose. Um, my next step, so I will be joining the Tanner Clinic uh, Family Physician Group uh, 
and I'll be working at the main Clayton location. There they are over there. I've been eyeing this, this clinic since med school, and I'm really thrilled to be joining them, so very excited for that opportunity. Uh, before we get too far, I am going to share a video, and it does have sound, so I just want to make sure that's, that's up and running. So, so you just watched the national championship clinching routine by the Weber State uh, Wildcat Cheer Squad here at the 20, 2022 uh, National Championship in Daytona Beach. Exactly. So for those of you who don't know, this wasn't their first, it wasn't their second, it wasn't their third, it wasn't their fourth, but it was their fifth straight national championship, and their sixth in eight years. Um, let me put that into context for you. So if we look at all the major universities and colleges here in Utah, like the University of Utah, Utah State, uh, BYU, UVU, no other club sport team or Division I team can boast a record like that. So it's what, quite impressive. And they're right here at Weber State. So, um, and then here's a, a picture celebrating that. You'll notice that there's two banners. For the first time ever, they went and entered into a small co-ed competition also came away with the national championship, so another impressive feat by them. So why do I bring up the cheer team? Usually when we talk about Division I, Division II athletes, we think of those major sports like football, uh, men's and women's basketball, women's soccer, softball, baseball. But there's a whole subset of athletes that we're overlooking, and these are the club uh, athletes. Oh, let me go back, sorry. So right here there represents the 22 clubs currently offered here at Weber State. And there, during the 2021-2022 season, there were approximately 400 athletes involved with these organizations. A little bit more about what is a club athlete. We know a little bit about NCAA athletes, but um, club athletes uh, uh, still compete at a high level, but there's no scholarships involved with club athletes and club sports. In fact, athletes who choose to play club sports at Weber State pay out of pocket to play, and they are run by students, and coaches volunteer their time to help run these teams. There might be a financial incentive for the club presidents. They may get a financial waiver, but other than that, there's no money involved. These club athletes still have to be involved a lot for practice. They have to practice two or three times a week. Then they go and compete 10 plus times a year at the very minimum, so they're very involved. They are able to go and travel all over regionally, Colorado, California, Texas, and compete against people regionally and then on a national championship level like we saw at Daytona Beach with the cheer team. This is just a couple of the pictures of the actual club teams here with uh, hockey, rugby, uh, lacrosse, biking, and uh, the men's soccer team. So what's the problem? That all sounds awesome. Well, what we're finding is that since these athletes lack an official NCAA sponsorship, they often lack uh, the notoriety that comes along with that. And due to that, they also tend to lack sufficient medical care um, for them. So we were approached by the club, the club sports department to provide uh, or assess if we could provide better medical care for them. And so after we got this, this, this uh, um, request, uh, we got together and we thought, well, it seems like, based on what we're hearing, is that, that these athletes do lack this individualized medical care, but if we were to offer it in a, in a free test clinic, they may be able to uh, benefit from it. And we did this in a couple ways. Um, first one is, is what we'll get to is try to do it in, a set, in an, an evidence-based manner. 
um, using a survey, which we'll get to. We also set up this free test clinic, and you can see a picture of the actual clinic where we see these athletes, and we spearheaded this uh, along with another resident that I'm pointing at right now, Josh Hansen, um, and we'll get into some data from that clinic a little later on. So the way uh, we did this, uh, I sent out a survey. It was a cross-sectional survey of all 400 athletes. It was anonymous. We sent it out in March of 2022, which is at the tail end of sort of the year after we'd had this clinic as well. We wanted to look at the demographics of these athletes, what injuries they were sustaining, um, what club teams they were involved with, as well as where were they seeking their medical care. Uh, we did have a somewhat poor response rate. Uh, we had 34 responses total. Uh, we even sent it out twice and still only got 34 responses, 8.5%. I'm not good at responding to surveys, so you can't blame them. Uh, oh, going back, these were a couple of the questions that, that were there. There were 12 base questions, and then dependent on their answers, others were open to them. So what did we get from, from these results? So 74% of the respondents identified as, as male and 26 were female. As far as the ages, it ranged from 18 to 25, with the most being about 20 years of age, and then another peak at 23. But there's a wide-ranging age group there. And as far as, as those age groups, we wanted to see how long had they been here at Weber State and how long had they been involved with their club sport team. So on the left side, you can see uh, the response for how long they had been academically involved here at Weber State. Uh, the majority were between zero and two years. I'll mention the zero here was if they were in their first year but hadn't completed that first year, and that's true of the right graph as well, which also reflected that same, same uh, a uh, trend of zero to two years being the vast majority, but they were participating or here at least five years in some, in some cases. And then the makeup of the actual club athletes. Here's, here are the respondents. Uh, the snowboard team represented really well. They were the highest respondents. You see a picture of them there on the, the upper right there, but we had a smattering. We saw the bowling team respond, the weightlifting team, the rodeo team. Interestingly enough, you'll notice the cheer team is not represented here. They were probably winning another national championship. I don't know. In all honesty, they were, they were preparing to go down to Daytona, so that's probably why they, they weren't uh, responding, but um, they are out there for sure. Okay, so what, what is the injury distribution of these athletes? Of the 34 respondents, during their time involved with their club sports, we had eight people that had been injured in some way, and the breakdown of those injuries were uh, head led, the, led the, the way with the number of injuries, followed by knee and then ankle, foot, uh, shoulder, and hip brought up the rear there. When they had these injuries, we wanted to see where were they seeking their medical care, and there's two graphs here. Uh, on the left is the graph indicating those who had had those injuries, and then on the right are those who hypothetically in the future may sustain a, an injury, so that was open to everyone regardless of their pre previous responses. There's a whole smattering of, of these responses. There's one takeaway really is that the athletic trainer was their point of contact. And that's who they would interface with, which is important for us uh, to know who we need to be involved with. Uh, and as you can see, again, they go and see a lot of other people potentially after that. But athletic trainers tend to be their, their go-to person here. And then we wanted to see, again, we, I referenced that we had set up this free test clinic here on campus. And we wanted to see who's been utilizing this. The vast majority had not used it. In fact, Almost as many people didn't know that it even existed, which is eye-opening. We, we really wanted to make sure that people knew about this, but that's some good data uh, going forward. But there were some that were utilizing that, and I will bring that up here in just a sec. And then we just wanted to ask them, how important is it for you as an athlete in these club sports for you to have access to medical care here on campus? The way we, we asked this, was just a slider from zero to 100, zero being not very important or not important at all, to 100 being very important. We only had one response that said not super important, but the vast majority said they would like medical care here on campus, which is what we were hoping. That's what we, we had thought and, and uh, anticipate seeing there. So this graph, I'm going to correlate it back to this free test clinic that we'd set up. This, this data comes from Josh Hansen again. He has a great poster. You'll see it. The, the solid line is the actual patient numbers that we saw in this clinic. Uh, you can see it sort of ebbs and flows. That follows sort of the natural trend of the school year when people are here, as well as the sport team seasons. Um, the trend line is the dashed line there, indicating that we we're seeing increasing attendance there, which is great. Uh, the March, I just, it just circled that. That was when we sent out the survey. Again, we sent it in April again, just to see if we could get some more responses, but just wanted to correlate those times there, so. 
So what did we uh, learn from this? Remember, there are almost as many club athletes here at Weber State as our NCAA athletes, and they still sustain injuries uh, participating in these high-level sports and activities. Um, a lot of these still require medical care, and where they're seeing, seeking medical care has and still varies quite a bit. And so we were trying to uh, figure out a way to structure that. Um, in fact, one, one example that I just thought of, um, just seeing how they benefited from this, in the last couple of days, we had a cheerleader, again, bringing it home, who sustained a knee injury, and um, due to sort of the structure we had set up, was able to contact uh, Josh Hansen, myself, and be seen in the clinic and get medical care due to this. She had a, a tibial plateau fracture, actually. So we're able to expedite that process where in the past it may not have been there. So we're seeing that it is beneficial um, anecdotally as well as from the graphs, and we think that we can really um, meet that need there. We're going to continue collecting data. I'm going to reference him one more time, Josh Hansen. Um, we're going to continue collecting demographics of the people actually visiting this clinic, seeing what the athletes are, what injuries, how many times they visit the clinic, um, what other management they need, what referrals they have, so we get better data with the hope that making this a long-term thing uh, for the residents as well as the athletes. Uh, just some acknowledgement, acknowledgements. Uh, Dr. Madsen, Dr. Charman, they were the uh, faculty members that we interfaced with that helped us set this up. Josh Hansen, last time, uh, he's one of the residents there. Brianna Cutler was our main athletic trainer that we interfaced with that always was contacting us. She was great and really helped coordinate that. And then Morgan Fradley was the uh, associate director that helped us send this survey out to all these athletes. So that's it. Thank you. Hi, guys. My name is Bryce Barton. I'm a resident at McKady Hospital, third year. My presentation today is on improving pre-registration rates in resident COB clinic. Uh, first of all, just as an aside, Dr. Campbell said that this is one of his favorite parts of the conference is watching residents speak in front of everybody. He also really loved listening and watching us squirm presenting, uh, squirm while we're presenting complicated and confusing patients as interns. <laughs> Dr. Campbell, the venues may have changed, but the squirming has not. So, anyways. So, first of all, um, I have no financial or ethical conflicts of interest with regards to my presentation today. Again, a little bit about myself, resident over at McKady Hospital, third year. I've signed with Gunnison Valley Hospital in central Utah. You'll know there when you get there, but you won't know how to get there unless you mean to go there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be practicing full spectrum family medicine, running on my own clinic patients, my own um, doing outpatient clinic, doing OB, including C-sections, and helping out in the emergency room. I've got a wife and four kids, and they're absolutely everything to me. And my wife made this possible by getting them to sleep. And this is all wonderful. So I want you to use your imaginations. And some of you, like Josh Hansen, may require more imagination than others. And I'll stop referencing him, too. I want you to picture yourself in an obstetrics clinic. Uh, and it may take more imagination than for some than others again. And you find that on your schedule, you have a 40-year-old female who speaks Chukis, uh, Micronesian Island, in case you're wondering, on your schedule. She's very pregnant. Thankfully, she doesn't ski. Um, she has three children, she's going on four, and she just transferred care to you. She brings no records of how this pregnancy has gone so far. She has gestational diabetes. She did have an ultrasound by the OB ultrasound specialist, but you have no idea what it says because that hasn't resulted yet. Um, you don't have no idea how big this baby is. She has no, no mobile phone number, so there's no way to reliably contact her. But the appointment went well. Right? So one week later, she comes back, and you have the prenatal records and the obstetric ultrasound report. Specialist recommends delivery at 37 to 38 weeks because the baby looks to be too big because of her diabetes. And her prenatal records that she just brought with her show that she had a mild shoulder dystocia. So baby got stuck this last delivery a little bit. So she's now only two days from when it's recommended she be delivered uh, to be induced for labor, but you cannot schedule her because she needs to pre-register. And she's not pre-registered, and we will talk about her later. But for now, we're going to take a little detour. And this sets the stage for something called quality improvement. A lot of you are probably familiar with it. Really, all you need to know about it is that it's a process that you use to kind of standardize, decrease mistakes, um, you're trying to just improve care systematically. Uh, it can get really nitty-gritty, it can be really complicated. 
but the idea is to reduce variation. You're trying to achieve more predictable results and you're trying to improve outcome for yourself as well and most importantly for the patients. Um, in short, it's just a process that encourages more reliable results, safety, and it's more than anything a process. And so this presentation is about how we applied quality improvement processes in our residency to kind of Im improve one point um, of this process. So what is, what is pre-registration? Uh, it's the process of the patient calling into the hospital where it creates an electronic encounter so that orders can be placed on in the electronic health record. If you don't have orders, they can't get scheduled for induction. So if they don't, if they're not pre-registered, they can't get scheduled for induction. You can't put orders in to tell, you know, to ask the nurses what you'd like done. And basically everything just kind of comes to a halting, grinding stop. The one caveat to this is the patient has to do this all by themselves. You cannot do it. Your office staff cannot do it. Um, even their significant other, they have not been able to do that as well. And this is just one example of a small problem that affected our practice and we wanted to tackle ourselves. Um, we all have processes, processes that drive us crazy, um, not just in obstetrics. It can be scheduling, it can be a procedure, it can be putting things together. And I just want you to, while we're going through this together, I want you guys to think about something in your practice that you may find a little bit of a kind of irksome and think about ways you may want to fix this. So a little bit about our prenatal clinic. It's done at Midtown Community Health Center and we love the work we do there. It's run by the residents, the residency faculty and staff, as well as Midtown staff. It's estimated that 70% of our patients are uninsured. It's estimated about 50% of our patients require an interpreter. There's a myriad of languages spoken by our patients which include, but not limited to, it's starting to sound like a differential now. English, Spanish, Portuguese, Marshallese, Russian, Romanian, Chukis, Kinyarwanda, I had to rehearse this beforehand, Burmese, and there's a lot of others. There's 21 residents, each of them have varying degrees of interest in OV, some will not be named, uh, has limited time in the OB clinic due to residency schedule demands. So our residency schedule kind of dictates we can't spend a lot of time. We get about two or three half days of clinic a month. And so accordingly, we can't see our same patients just between our schedule and their schedule. Sometimes they see other residents. And so it's hard to have continuity care, but ultimately we end up delivering our continuity patients. It breaks my heart to say, I'm not going to walk you guys through this process, but you can just appreciate it. Um, all you need to know that if there's, a break if there's a breakdown in any of these sections, the process can very likely be halted and that can be a little bit frustrating for everybody. And I've highlighted in red some of these um, steps where the process that our, our QI was aimed at um, affecting. All right. So suffice it to say, I feel a mixture of these emotions when we're having to pre-register a patient to get them scheduled for induction. And one of these emotions is not love. <laughs> so we're going with that. <laughs> yes, that's love. So this is called a driver diagram. I want you to ignore this, again, as it breaks my heart to say that. The, what I want you to understand is it's simply a problem-solving process we went through to find out what were our problems, what could we do about them, starting at the left. Um, is the problem and then we kind of break it down piece by piece and then on the far right are possible interventions that we could undertake and as you can see this box in blue <coughs> is where we decided to focus our efforts because it seemed to be most efficient it, it seemed to tackle or at least address in some way the problems that we we felt were most within our reach um, again the blue box is where we wanted to make our changes anywhere where one of these processes could have broken down is where we could have a problem. The whole pre-registration process can break down. This is an actual photo of us, of me, actually, when I was younger trying to understand this process. Um, actually, it was at a Kansas City airport at 4.30 in the morning trying to go home for a Christmas break. My son was scowling at a man across the bench from him. The man said, he looks on the outside how I feel on the inside. <laughs> yeah. And maybe some of, you, some of you can relate to him, but there's hope. So my aim statement for my project was to standardize the 30 to 32 week appointment for OB um, for our, our obstetrics, pre our prenatal visits. Um, we decide, decided to appoint that visit as um, basically our pre-registration visit. And the reason we did this is because the MAs have less scheduled stuff to do. You don't have to do 
um, like prenatal monitoring necessarily. You don't have to um, do phenol monitoring, no blood draws, no injections, so on and so forth. So, and on, on the right here we have a, a to-do list that we do, that we have hung up in the resident room and that kind of tells us and reminds us what we can do at which appointments based on how far the patient is, what needs to be checked or done. Um, the reason we chose 32 weeks is the MAs that we were asking about the process actually told us, hey, this would be a very good time for us because there's not as much for us to do. So it was kind of, kind of bringing the team into the process. Dr. Mike Ivan, one of my co-residents, created the text for our intervention. I've highlighted it here in red. And both our projects just happened to dovetail into each other. And so we used the same intervention after we coordinated with each other. Um, this slide is really just telling you about data collection and, and what we did. So again, like I highlighted in red, at 30 to 32 weeks, we changed that paper, we hung it in the resident room with that new text that was highlighted in red, and then we just kind of let things roll, and we had the MAs kind of on board with doing the 32, 30 to 32 week, talk to the patient, get them pre-registered as best we can, and then also talk to the primary OB resident who doesn't necessarily see the patient all the pregnancy, so they kind of can get lost to follow up a little bit that way. So the, the data process was collected at two points in time. One was a month before the intervention went into place, um, and our second set of data was taken two months after the process was put in place, or the, basically the paper was hung up and the MAs were, were asked to talk about this pre-registration process. Anybody who was less than 32 weeks um, during the time of evaluation was excluded. Anybody who was over 35 weeks we went back and looked at their chart. If they were noted to be pre-registered in our chart, then they were counted. Um, and really our intervention was just hanging up that paper. So let's talk results here. The graph here shows absolute percentages of patients who are pre-registered in the clinic. The gold bars represent pre-intervention numbers. The green bars represent post-intervention numbers. So gold was before we put the paper up with the changes. Green was after we put up the paper with the changes. As you can see, the class average for pre-registration rose proportionally from 8% up to 43%. Um, you, know, you know, you say maybe that's a 35% increase. That's pretty good, but it was pretty bad before. So I, I'm not sure I can stress to you how, how important this is to my, my proud 30 resident heart. So this suggests that one class or even one person wasn't responsible for the dramatic change that took place. Uh, as, as you can see, it was evenly distributed throughout the residency in all classes. This also suggests that inexperi the inexperience of the first year class did, was not to blame for the poor pre-registration rates. It was kind of a problem throughout the whole residency. So maybe looking at it another way might be a little bit more um, dramatic. This shows the actual number of patients um, who were involved with data collection. As you can see, there was a 533% increase in the number of patients who pre-registered after we put our intervention into place. This is huge. <laughs> I honestly didn't expect this kind of improvement with such a small change, but you know, in our defense, we, we looked kind of hard at what the process was and where we wanted to tackle it, and so that's why we did that. Probably more importantly, subjectively speaking with my co-residents, um, there's been a dramatic improvement in how many of our patients have been pre-registered, and they appreciate getting the reminder that how far their patient is, and also we're not having to scramble for the same induction slots we're having to compete with the other community OB docs with. So it's just, it's easier on us. It makes us less frustrated, it makes the patients less frustrated. And arguably more important, it makes the labor and delivery nurses less frustrated. <laughs> so, uh, you know, conclusions. Our next step for the project is to determine if this was actually a lasting change or if this was something that's just gonna, you know, fast on, fast off. And so come, some of the limitations is the data was collected at two points in time, it was not trended. So obviously it would be more robust if we had collected it weekly or monthly and kind of seen like, was this, did this all happen really quickly after the intervention was put into place? And you know, just more data is a little bit more robust. So, kind of in summary, coming full circle, our two key speak, speaking patient uh, that we spoke about earlier was kept in the clinic um, while we had the two keys interpreter on, on the phone and so we organized a three-way phone call. We, get her, we got her pre-registered with the with the labor and delivery floor, we then scrambled to find an indicated slot three days later, which is just one day after the recommended time um, by the specialist. She had a routine vaginal delivery. It was, went fine, there was no issue. The baby did well and she's now the proud mother of four. Our one intervention resulted in a 35% increase in pre-registration rates 
and resulted in a relative 533% increase in pre-registration rates. It's pretty dramatic for a small but well-researched um, change we wanted to implement. So I realize OB may not be part of everybody's practice, it may not hold any interest for anybody, but this, this process certainly does hold a little bit of promise. If you put in a little bit of time and find something that drives you a little bit crazy, you may want to look at, look at processes in your clinic, in your lives, and see what you can do to simplify it and make small changes and kind of see where that takes you. Hopefully this piques your interest in finding uh, ways you can tweak your practice to make dramatic impactful changes for yourselves and for your clinic, because I know it will certainly benefit you. A couple of acknowledgements. This was a big, kind of just kind of a big breakdown, a big evaluation process, and there are a lot of people I want to thank, but uh, to shorten it down, Midtown Prenatal Clinic, especially faculty and staff, especially Dr. Kurt Reifelman for the demographics and his help, and as well as Norma Coria for keeping the clinic running smoothly and for their invaluable input. Uh, McKady Family Medicine residency faculty and colleagues, especially Mike Ivan, who put up the intervention and kind of uh, worded it. His poster is also on display at this conference. Also want to thank Dr. Clark Madsen for suggestions on how to gather and present the data. Finally, I want to thank the labor and delivery staff and laborers who work so closely with us, and thank you guys for your time and attention. Well, that was excellent. The proud father. <laughs> excellent. Well done. So, um, particularly, Bryce Barton talked about quality improvement. Residencies across the board now, not just family medicine, are required to have a quality improvement training experience. And that concept that Bryce mentioned applies not only to the residency and their experience there, but hopefully will go uh, and accompany them into their practice, but beyond that can be used to change challenges in the life. It's the sort of training that helps you say, gosh, there's, there's a piece of sand in my shoe. It's really annoying. I wonder what I can do to make it better. That's quality improvement, and it applies across the board. So now we have the opportunity to ask them questions. So again, uh, Taylor spoke about uh, sports, uh, not sports medicine, wilderness medicine. Justin talked about club sports and the need to provide care there and showed the Weber State. So that whole video, by the way, that was just about a third quarter of that video. It's unbelievable. Humans are not supposed to be thrown that high. And then Bryce, of course, mentioned the OB and the quality improvement involved in that uh, study. So questions. Uh, if there are questions, please go to the microphones. Yes, I have a question for Taylor. So what happened to the pregnant woman on the ski slope? Uh, I delivered four days later. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and everything worked out okay. Yes, that was me, by the way. Oh, uh, good. <laughs> yeah, that was my picture. Uh, I did go skiing. I just did one run just to say that I did it. And I had my husband behind me playing defense and... So uh, I delivered four days later, and Van is now five months old and doing very well. Great. Thank you. I have a question for Justin. It was clear that there were a lot of athletes who didn't know about your program. Is there a way that you could work with the different programs so that you could present, like, say, the first meeting of the year so that they would know that you have this available for them? That's a great question and something that we thought of as well. And we've sort of identified, I think, ways we can do that. I mentioned Morgan Bradley. She's sort of head of the, the club athlete department. We can get in touch with her and then have, have uh, the communication sent out to all the club athlete or team directors there. And we're also thinking of social media as well. It seems like maybe email is less effective than maybe social media or something like that. Um, so there are ways that we've identified to hopefully get it out earlier and, and more effectively, for sure. Yes, also for Justin, uh, with uh, Weaver State uh, having many students, I, I believe this is true, that are, are live locally, uh, not as big of a campus presence. I'm wondering how much of the low response rate was because as opposed to some bigger campuses where you have a lot of students on campus away from home that they have in this case their own PCPs their own doctors in the community that they rely on as opposed to taking advantage of your program which I think by the way is a great great program and idea 
Yeah, it's interesting. So something I did not include, but we did did ask about was if they had a PCP and if they see them regularly. It was about 50 percent. Again, the response rate was low. So whether that is indicative of all the athletes, not sure. But to your point, there are a lot of local local people. So that's something that we're trying to take into account and not step on toes, but still provide that care. Hey, uh, first off, I just want to congratulate all your whole class. I don't know how you guys do what you do in the hospital, play as hard as you guys play and also do research. So, hey, nice job, guys. Um, Bryce, question for you. I mean, really, the crux of what you're talking about is the hospitals are requiring the patients to pre-register. Um, but is there, did you explore, does the hospital have some responsibility in being able to provide language services? That's my question. So that's a great question. So we only deliver right now at McKady Hospital, so this is not representative of Davis or um, Ogden, uh, sorry, Ogden Regional Medical Center. So I can't speak for any of the other hospitals, but they, they do, but it was a little bit trickier for our more, for the less common languages. So Chu Keys was definitely one they struggled with. They didn't have a problem with Spanish interpreters. Um, they did fine with Romanian and Russian, but Chukis, Burmese, um, Kinderwanda were all ones that they needed extra help with. And I'm not sure. Just the report I got, just in, and this is all just speaking from the labor and delivery nurses, they just couldn't access anybody at the time when it was done. So maybe they just didn't have the number of interpreters needed to reach out to, but that was, that was one of our big hurdles where the language is not as commonly spoken. So at my table, one of the physicians, um, when you were first presenting, Bryce, said, well, why do they even have to pre-register at all? It seems just an annoyance. Can you briefly mention the practicality of why that's necessary? This is well above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I, I think part of it is just to kind of help create that electronic encounter for somebody who isn't in the system, I don't, I don't fully understand that process entirely, but. Yeah, I think that's correct, that the reason is the electronic medical record and billing. And remember, of course, that as you all know as, as providers, the electronic medical records were entirely created for your benefit and your patients. Except it's all about billing, right? Okay, so any other questions for these three? All right, round of applause. Thank you very much. Excellent. <laughs>